I'm CBS 8's Jenny Day. Welcome to Around San Diego. I'll fill you in on the top stories from this week and look ahead at what's to come. We have everything from where to park at the airport that's now under construction to possible police officer terminations, as well as dolphins, drones, and your guide to pride. So let's start there with safety being the top priority. We are now just days away from the San Diego Pride Parade and after the recent mass shootings at an Illinois parade, some people are on edge. That's why San Diego police officials say they are increasing security. They plan to have a uniformed officer at every intersection, as well as plainclothes officers in the crowd. They are also working with the state and federal law enforcement agencies to monitor the threats that might be made online. Well, obviously, anytime we have a large gathering, we're concerned that people are going to take advantage of the environment. And again, that's why we're going to be out there. Yeah, police say they want people to come out and have a good time, but also stay vigilant and report anything suspicious. Again, that Pride Parade is happening on July 16th in Hillcrest. It is one of the biggest events this month, but not the only one. There are several other events prior to the parade. Regina Urita has your Pride Guide. After two years of being virtual, events for Pride are back, which means San Diego's Pride Week is jam-packed with lots of in-person rainbow fun. For those of you thinking, what events can I attend? How far do I have to drive? How much will it cost me? Or how can I show my pride? Well, don't worry, because I've got you covered on all things justice with joy. <laughs> If you're interested in female or non-binary empowerment, start with SheFest on July 9th, an event that celebrates and supports LGBTQ plus women and non-binary people in San Diego. The event is hosted by a volunteer committee that kicks off San Diego's Pride Week in July. There will be special music performances, workshops, art activities, and interviews with LGBTQ plus activists. The event is located near the Hillcrest Pride flag on University Avenue and starts at noon. If you skip Sunday Mass and want to support San Diego's LGBTQ LGBTQ plus community, you can join St. Paul's Episcopal Cathedral in their fantastic and colorful event. Light Up the Cathedral will take place on July 13th at 7 p.m. You can join LGBTQ plus faith leaders and other locals as they gather together to celebrate faith and resilience. The event will start with an evening mass and after the service, the cathedral will be lit up with hundreds of LED rainbow colors for Pride Month. There is no cost and parking is available. As for Pride Weekend, starting on July 15th, you can start with some free barbecue by joining San Diego Pride at the Spirit of Stonewall Rally at the Hillcrest Pride Flag. The rally celebrates community leaders who are demanding action to some of the movement's pressing issues. Those in attendance can hear from speakers fighting for LGBTQ plus resources. It starts at 6 p.m. and there is no cost. <laughs> If the Friday night fun doesn't leave you too exhausted, maybe the Pride 5K run will join hundreds of sprinters showing off their pride by running to the Hillcrest finish line. The 5K run starts at the corner of University on July 6. You can register online. Tickets to participate cost $49. <laughs> But the weekend Pride Fun is just getting started. After the 5K run, it's the annual Pride Parade. Join our CBS 8 team and thousands of other organizations at one of the largest gay parades in the nation. Here's a map of some of the streets that will be closed off. These check-in points will be where people participating in the parade can stage their floats. The parade begins at the Hillcrest Pride flag on University Avenue and ends on Laurel Street, where you'll find the entrance to the Pride Festival. The streets will be crowded with people and organizers recommend that you take public transportation since parking will be nearly impossible. After the Pride Parade, it's your time to be loud and proud at the two-day Pride Festival. Hundreds of LGBTQ plus entertainers will perform on stage in Balboa Park. It starts at 11 a.m. Tickets are $32 and includes entry to the two-day festival. Happy Pride! Now, these are only some of the events taking place during San Diego's Pride Week. There's also local businesses like Gossip Grill and other restaurants that have food and drink specials for Pride Month. If you want a full list of the Pride events in San Diego, you can head to our website at CBS8.com. Regina Yurita, CBS8.
Regina, thanks again. July, certainly a busy month for San Diego. Comic-Con is also happening. Mayor Todd Gloria says these events are critical to our economy. They are expected to bring in hundreds of thousands of tourists who will stay in hotels, eat at local restaurants, and shop at local businesses. And these are dollars that we use to address homelessness, to fix our roads, uh, to fund our parks and our libraries, and just about every other city service that we provide that keeps the city running. In 2021, overall, visitors spent over $7 billion in San Diego, which is lower than pre-pandemic levels. But there were 24 million visitors in 2021, which is 60% higher than in 2020. Speaking of tourism, summer travel may be getting a little more hectic at the San Diego International Airport as they start a new construction project, causing some traffic rerouting. CBS 8's Brian White shows us how the construction will change the traffic flow. A busy day here at the San Diego International Airport for 4th of July travel, but starting tomorrow may get even more congested as they begin a major construction project here at Terminal 1. Coming in, it's pretty bad. With all the construction going on, there was a lot of things that were backed up. Lots of people coming and going on the July 4th holiday, and that meant a lot of traffic. It's crazy. It's really congested, and if you don't know, you know, who, who your driver is or where they're coming from, it's very hard to see and understand who's picking you up. Most flights were on time today. Our Southwest flight took off on time from Midway, landed here on time. We we're perfect. Bill Girth and his wife are visiting for a few days, and their flight out was delayed just a little bit. 20 minute delay. Not too bad. Actually, it helped us because we were 20 minutes behind. <laughs> but some others were frustrated by transportation delays. Well, I just flew in from Chicago and I tried to catch the rental car shuttle, but they're very slow under the new system here. Starting tomorrow and running through Friday, construction crews will be dismantling this pedestrian bridge at Terminal 1. So they're going to have to rearrange a few things temporarily. Any of the ground transportation services that people utilize, such as rideshare, taxi, any of the courtesy vehicles, is now going to be located temporarily in the Terminal 1 parking lot. Passenger car drop-offs and pickups will be rerouted on Thursday and Friday over to the ground transportation area nearby as they take down the final segment of the bridge. This is all part of the process for construction of the new Terminal 1 parking plaza, which will have over 5,000 parking spaces and should take about two years to build. If you are going to be flying out uh, July 5th through the 8th, uh, just allow some extra time because there will be, again, some detours, some lane closures, and, and likely some traffic because of the construction. At San Diego International, I'm Brian White for CBS 8. Brian, thank you. Well, a quick trip into Baja is an easy and familiar option for many San Diegans, especially now in the heart of summer. But the recent arrest of a prominent cartel leader has forced the U.S. Embassy in Mexico to issue a travel warning for Americans. That travel advisory right now is at a level three out of four, meaning a serious risk. So much so the U.S. Embassy and consulates in Mexico are asking you to reconsider your plans. Tourists, though, are rarely the target, but the worry is that you could be caught in the crossfire of these ongoing territorial disputes. Again, an arrest of a cartel leader has raised the potential for confrontations between these criminal organizations and Mexican security forces. The warning is for both Tijuana and Rosarito. Mexico is, of course, concerned with how this will impact tourism, so you can expect to see an increase in law enforcement. But the people we spoke to say they don't want fear to keep them from experiencing other parts of the world. We felt very safe um, going um, around by ourselves and shopping and eating. We just be careful and um, go about your business. Can, danger happens everywhere. Yeah, if you do still make the trip, the State Department recommends the basics. Be aware of your surroundings and keep a low profile. Meantime, the Biden administration announced it's going to finish part of former President Trump's border wall right here in San Diego. The sections are 30 feet high, would cut off Friendship Park and eliminate the Friendship Gate. Here's CBS 8's David Gottfriedson. 30 foot walls in the middle of a park would really be antithetic to this idea of cross-border friendship. 
The idea of a cross-border friendship park began 51 years ago, when First Lady Pat Nixon landed on the beach in a helicopter to inaugurate Borderfield State Park. She had the Secret Service cut the barbed wire so she could greet Mexican citizens who had gathered on the Tijuana side of the border. And her and all the other officials that were there kind of declared it as the first phase in what they would like to be International Friendship Park. Daniel Watman with the nonprofit Friends of Friendship Park remembers the days when the Border Patrol would open the gate on the weekends to let families visit each other through the fence. The government shut down those visits at the beginning of the pandemic, and now comes news that the gate will be eliminated and replaced with a pair of 30-foot walls all the way to the ocean. There's no consultation with, with anybody from the community. It was just DHS consulted with local Border Patrol who cited safety uh, for their agents. And that was the only point of view that was given as far as whether they should put those 30 foot walls in or not. The original plan for expanded border walls through Friendship Park came from the Trump administration. Construction was halted when President Biden took office. But Watman says 10 days ago, the Border Patrol told him construction was back on again and an electric gate would be installed for vehicle access. This isn't just any old part of the border. This is a special space. So, and they're just treating it like any other part of the border where they put 30 foot walls in and they put rolling gates for their vehicles and that's it. David, thank you. And we want you to know that new resources for immigrants in San Diego are coming to the city of San Diego. Mayor Todd Gloria announced the creation of the city's new Office of Immigrant Affairs. The goal is to advocate for immigration rights as well as provide translation and interpretation services. The office will also help local foreign-born communities with workforce development. Rita Fernandez there, the current director of Global Affairs, will also serve as the office's executive executive director. Now let's talk water. If you've poured yourself a glass from your home faucet recently and something just doesn't taste right, you're not alone. We've received several calls from City of San Diego water customers who say their water tastes like dirt. CBS 8's Jasmine Ramirez has been working to get to the bottom of it and shares what she's learned. Tonight I've been speaking with people who say the water coming out of their faucet tastes and smells like dirt. Tonight, we have an answer from the city about why this is happening. It smells like a weird soapy sewage smell, almost like very, very faint. Had you noticed that happening in the past? Honestly, no. An apartment manager who wishes to remain anonymous got a similar complaint from her tenants. Last Wednesday, I got a call from a property over on Nutmeg and Bankers Hill stating that his water from the tap tasted like dirt. People living in Bankers Hill, Hillcrest, Golden Hill, North and South Park have all told me their water's taste or smell has changed. So at first I just mentioned to my partner, I was like, hey, maybe it's our faucet, maybe it's our shower head, maybe we need to clean with different products or something. But then after a while, I was like, maybe it's something else. I emailed and called the San Diego Water Authority and the city. I received a statement from the city tonight saying San Diego water customers may notice a temporary change in taste and smell of drinking water caused by an organic compound called MIB. It's like once or twice I'll smell it throughout the day, but after a while I'm kind of getting used to it, which is not good. Some kinds of algae and bacteria can be found in lakes and reservoirs and advanced treatments could remove them. MIB concentrations are known to increase in the summer months when levels are low and water temperatures warm up. The city says while the taste and odor can be unpleasant, MIB does not have any adverse health effects and is not toxic or harmful. The drinking water is produced by the Alvarado Water Treatment Plant. That plant provides water for customers in the central section of the city. I found some helpful tips online for anyone struggling with their tap water. You can try adding lemon juice or chilling the water to improve the taste. I wish the city would uh, let people know what's going on so that you don't find out by drinking it yourself. And again, the city says the water meets all quality standards and is safe to drink. They expect the smell and odor to go away in the next few days. Jasmine Ramirez, CBS 8.
And don't forget here at CBS 8, we are working for you. If there's an issue you'd like us to look into, email us at workingforyou at cbs8.com. Well, about 20 San Diego police officers could soon be fired if they don't comply with COVID guidelines. The city granted religious and medical exemptions in December, but now the city says those who opted out of the vaccine are still not meeting standards. In addition to the police department, the city says termination letters have been sent to two dozen other employees in various departments for failing to comply with the weekly testing requirement. Now, providing a negative COVID test once a week is required if you are one of the hundreds of city employees who did not get the vaccine and requested an exemption. Overall, about 45 city employees could soon be fired. I spoke with the head of the San Diego Police Officer Association who said this is like pouring gasoline on a fire that is is already burning out of control. Now that's because recruiting and retaining officers has been an issue for years. The president, Jared Wilson, went on to say that already 240 officers chose to go elsewhere in the last fiscal year. That combined with rising crime rates and high response times, the association says the city cannot afford to lose even one more officer. The police officers association is asking for the mayor to revisit this decision saying it will only put further strain on the department and truly comes down to public safety. The city, of course, argues it's also looking out for public safety. A city sp spokesperson told me that the 45 people who received termination notices have for the most part never taken a test since it became a requirement about three months ago. If they change their mind and agree to take the test, they can immediately keep their job. City employees otherwise are at a 90% vaccination rate. Well, we are learning the family of Rebecca Zahau has dropped a lawsuit against former San Diego County Sheriff Bill Gore. Sheriff's investigators ruled Zahau's death in 2011 a suicide after her body was found bound and gagged, hanging from the balcony of a Coronado mansion. CBS 8's Kelly Hesedal explains what the Zahau family plans to do next. Well, the family had initially uh, sued Sheriff Bill Gore, former Sheriff Bill Gore, over documents related to the case that they say uh, the sheriff was hiding, but they have now dropped that lawsuit against him. Take a listen to what uh, the family's attorney, Keith Greer, told me just minutes ago. We found out, uh, shockingly, that uh, we were looking for what the sheriff's instructions were to that group of three officers that were reviewing the evidence again for a second time. We just wanted to see in writing you know, what he told them to do. And uh, we found out uh, by his declaration that uh, he never put his instructions in writing. And so Greer says they dropped the lawsuit against Gore because he says there was nothing else to gain from him in this case. He says the instructions they wanted apparently don't exist. Uh, he also says, according to the pleadings, that Gore has admitted to not giving the whole case file to the Zahau family. Now, the family initially had wanted him to be deposed, uh, but Greer says the judge sided with the county and ruled that that would not happen. Now, the family is turning their attention to the medical examiner trying to get the cause of death on the death certificate changed from suicide to undetermined or homicide. You may remember Adam Shackney, Jonah Shackney's brother, was found guilty of her death in a civil case back in 2018. The jury awarded the family $5 million in damages. And Greer says that they were able to get uh, the cause of death changed on the death certificate. The hope is they can then get the case reopened. He says the goal in all of this is to have Adam Shackney held criminally responsible for Rebecca as a house death. Kelly has it all CBS 8. Kelly, thanks. And also this week, a California woman was given a new lease on life. She was convicted as a teenager for killing the man who had forced her into prostitution. Governor Newsom granted a pardon to Sarah Cruzen, who is now 44 years old. CBS 8's Richard Allen has more on her fight and more on what other young victims of human traffickers have to say. Well, that's right. This case has stirred the debate over the way courts often treat survivors of abuse, especially when they're teens. I definitely know I deserve punishment. I mean, you don't just um, take somebody's life and think that it's okay. 
This is Sarah Cruzan speaking from prison in 2009, 15 years after she fatally shot George Howard, a family friend who she says had begun abusing her when she was 11 years old and began to sexually traffic her when she was 13. I found the ability to believe in myself. I have a lot of good to offer. Cruzan, who lived for a while with family in San Diego, was 16 years old when she killed her pimp in a motel room in Riverside and 17 when she was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. She went on to serve 18 years behind bars before Governor Newsom's predecessor, Jerry Brown, agreed to her early release. She's a victim. She was trafficked. She was tortured. And then she was a minor when the, all this started. Marissa Ugarte is executive director of the Bilateral Safety Corridor Coalition, a San Diego-based nonprofit dedicated to combating human trafficking and helping its victims. She was part of a coalition of reform groups which fought for Cruzan's release. It was just unbelievable that they would put her in prison for something like this when she tried to save herself from a predator, from a pimp. Ugarte was elated when she heard that nearly a decade after her release, Cruzan, who now works as an advocate for parolees, has been pardoned by Governor Newsom. Ugarte also points out that in the nearly three decades since Cruzan first went to prison, the problem of sex trafficking continues. It has gotten worse. In fact, San Diego ranks 13th in the country for human sex trafficking, with up to 8,000 victims every year. Parents, you should be concerned. You need to be aware. You need to ask the right questions. You need to be there for the children. And for local resources on combating human trafficking, just go to cbsa.com and click on the help button. Richard, appreciate it. Well, many celebrated on the 4th of July, of course, others use the day to continue fighting for abortion rights. More than 100 people gathered for a rally in downtown San Diego. Jasmine Ramirez reports many advocates there said when women are not free, no one is free. Rally attendees gathered here at the Hall of Justice. They marched through the streets of downtown, chanting abort the Supreme Court and separate church and state. I can't justify celebrating the 4th in full this year because of what's been overturned in the Supreme Court. My body, my body. She and so many others spent their Independence Day rallying behind women's independence and reproductive rights. We will not stop until changes are made and people are angry. Women and men stood in solidarity. I mean, look at this movement. Uh, how, how, how could you not be with it? I think it's a better time for a man to be out here than just women fighting it alone. I think they need as much power and as, much, as many people behind them as possible to help move forward instead of backwards. Ayla Spence said she made the difficult decision to have an abortion at just 19 years old. She's in disbelief that years later, millions of women don't have the same constitutional right. Knowing that girls and just people across the, the, the country aren't going to have that choice anymore is just appalling to me. Fear surrounds what ripple effect the Supreme Court's ruling may have. What's going to happen in the future? We're all incredibly scared of all of our rights for all people who are historically underrepresented. The group Women's Rights San Diego organized the rally here at the Hall of Justice. They say they'll continue rallying for abortion rights and encourage the community to join them. Jazz Ramirez, CBS 8. Well, people who live in a Tecolote Canyon neighborhood are pushing for stop signs and speed bumps on a street they say is dangerous. Brian White has been on that street working for you and talking to neighbors. Here in this neighborhood near Tecolote Canyon, neighbors say this street here, Via Las Cumbres, is extremely dangerous. They want to see the city do something about it. We want to leave and try to pull out. We're kind of taking our life in our hands. Tom McCullough tells me this intersection here at Via Las Cumbres in Caminito del Cervato has a blind spot, making it very hard to see oncoming cars. Well, it's scary because you never know for sure, even though there's the mirror, it's kind of dirty half the time and kind of hard to see. And you also have the cars coming from the other direction. Neighbors say cars on this road often travel too fast. There is a barrage of cars that drive way over this speed limit of 25 that we see here. And they pointed out to me another intersection at Via Las Cumbres and Caminito Listo, where cars come barreling down the hill, making it unsafe for people to cross. I do fear for many people with babies 
strollers. Older people, there are elderly in the neighborhood and they walk very slowly. Christian Tordahl lives on the corner and he says they've had a number of accidents here in recent years. There was a van that flipped over on this side and hit a parked car. There was another car that over here that went sideways into my car, which was parked. And there was another car that came barreling down here sometime in the middle of the night up onto this sidewalk, knocked down the side, the stop sign into my driveway. They've been begging the city of San Diego for traffic calming measures for several years now. I hope that we get speed bumps put in, and if not that, then at least stop signs. I reached out to the city's transportation department, and they say a traffic study was done here in 2020. And this stretch of road qualified for traffic calming signs that show your speed like this one you see here. But it didn't meet the criteria for stop signs, apparently. Either way, the project has been on the unfunded list ever since. It's just really frustrating because this is a community that means a lot to us, and it just feels like our requests are falling on deaf ears. I also reached out to the Linda Vista Planning Group to see if they'll consider Consider hearing this issue at their upcoming meeting on July 25th. Working for you, I'm Brian White for CBS 8. Yeah, as mentioned, we are working for you. So if there's an issue you'd like us to look into, email us at workingforyou at cbsa.com. Well, as I continue to take you around San Diego, let's talk money now. Rent prices are starting to cool down. According to the National Rent Report from Zemper, prices here fell last month. The median price here for a one-bedroom apartment is $2,320. That's about 6% less than the month of May. However, it is still expensive here and prices have gone up 20% from last year. Well, MTS is offering a big bonus to try and attract new employees. It's giving a $5,000 sign-on bonus to newly signed bus drivers. Newly signed bus cleaners will get $1,000. MTS is also actively recruiting for dozens of other positions, including trolley operators, mechanics, and station ambassadors. You can find more information like how to apply on cbsa.com. Well, as the war in Ukraine rages on, dozens of its top athletes are now here in San Diego. Members of the Ukrainian Athletic Federation are being hosted by the Chula Vista Elite Athlete Training Center as they get ready for competition on the world stage. Richard Allen has more on the support they've received and their struggle to focus here as the Russian invasion continues back home. Well, that's right. These 37 athletes and coaches from Ukraine began arriving here in Chula Vista late last month to prepare for the World Athletics Championship in Oregon. Intense training for these athletes that's being overshadowed by the ongoing war in their homeland. It is our hope that you feel and experience our hospitality, our welcome. For more than a week, these track and field stars of the Ukrainian Athletic Federation have been hosted by the Chula Vista Elite Athlete Training Center, a U.S. Olympic and Paralympic training site. So us here in this country have little idea all that you and your families have experienced. Our hearts have broken with you. Support that these athletes and their coaches say they felt since arriving here. Thanks God we have such good friends like you, like American people uh, who support us in uh, our fight and we understand that we are not alone. Anna Rishkova, who competes in the 400 meter hurdle and on the relay team, says that up until this point, she and her fellow athletes had been separated by the war, forced to train in separate locations. Here we are all together and we feel like a family. Still, Anna says it has been difficult to concentrate as war rages back home. It's really hard to mentally because 24 hours per day I am worried about my family, about my friends who are in Ukraine now. I try to do my best. Sprinter Anastasia Brzgina is from Lugansk in eastern Ukraine, which has now been occupied by Russian forces, including even her family's home there. And it's really disgusting because uh, some strangers, people, came to your house and lived uh, without any rules. She also supports the ban imposed on Russian athletes by World Athletics. I honestly wish that uh, to feel that nobody wants to compete with uh, people who support the war, who support the killing children. And as they focus on competition here in the U.S., these athletes say they are praying for peace back home. We want uh, to go back to our country and just live safe and 
you know, uh, to have our lives back. And the 2022 World Athletics Championship is set to get underway in Eugene, Oregon next week. For more information, just go to CBS8.com and click on the online version of this story. Richard, thank you. Well, now to a last ditch effort by the Mexican government to save the world's most endangered marine mammal in the Sea of Cortez. There are only about 10 vaquita porpoises left off the coast of San Felipe. So as David Godfredson reports, the plan involves sinking hundreds of underwater hooks to catch the gill nets, killing the tiny mammals. On Friday, the Mexican government plans to start sinking these large cement blocks with 11-foot hooks in the Sea of Cortez in an effort to save the nearly extinct vaquita porpoise. Only about 10 of the 4-foot-long mammals are believed to exist in the waters off San Felipe. Fishermen who use gill nets to catch an illegally trafficked fish called the tatuaba are blamed for killing off the vaquita. The tiny mammals get caught in the gill nets and drown. San Felipe is about a five hour drive from San Diego. The area where the underwater hooks will be installed is called the zero tolerance zone. The underwater hooks are meant to snag the gill nets and keep them out of the vaquita area. But the plan has its skeptics. It's an untested solution. It has been put together with very little uh, scientific inputs and also very little transparencies. Andrea Crosta is the executive director of Earth League International and an expert on the vaquita. Activities at sea are important, so anti-poaching, removal of the nets, working with local communities, working with the fishermen, very important. But it's more important to investigate and destroy the Totoaba trafficking networks that have been behind this tragedy for at least 10 years. The swim bladder of the Totoaba fish can sell in China for tens of thousands of dollars, leading to a huge demand for illegal fishing with gill nets in the Sea of Cortez. So you can remove all the nets you want, you can put all the blocks you want, but as long as you don't also go after these important players, you will not solve anything. Yeah, in China, the swim bladder of that totuaba can cost more by weight than gold. It's made into a soup, and people incorrectly believe it can treat infertility and circulation problems. David, thank you. Well, our beaches, however, here locally are looking cleaner after the mess left behind over the 4th of July holiday. From Oceanside to Ocean Beach, volunteers picked up nearly a ton of trash. They picked up a total of 1,645 pounds of trash on July 5th. Wow. Ocean Beach's Dog Beach was by far the heaviest haul with volunteers bringing in 735 pounds of trash. Fiesta Island 450 pounds of garbage and 143 pounds at the Ocean Beach Pier. Oceanside uh, Pier had 111 pounds. So certainly our thanks to the volunteers with the Surfrider Foundation who spanned out across our coastline to pick up that trash. Their biggest concern, cigarette butts and plastic. Unlike other materials, it doesn't break down. So it's not like paper or aluminum even where it's breaking down and becoming inert or nothing essentially. Plastic breaks up. So while you might not be able to see it after some time, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And all throughout its cycle of doing that, it's getting eaten. So it's finding its way into our food chain and finding its way into our fertilizers. It's getting small enough that it's getting absorbed as rainwater. It's truly everywhere. Yeah, that is Alex Farron with Surfrider Foundation San Diego. She says about 50 volunteers showed up in OB picking up trash on what she refers to as the dirtiest day of the year. Volunteers spanned out again all the way up the coastline and ranged in age from 80 to nine years old. I found um, cigarettes um, and some plastic shovels and some paper. And what do you think about when you see trash on the beach? What do you think about that? I think it's sad because animals could die eating that because they don't know what that is.
Yeah, it is sad. We can do better, right? She was out there with her mom and grandma, so three generations of their family, helping keep our beaches clean. Her mom says her kid's future is at stake, and she says we need to be doing everything we can to save the environment. Well, the fair also wrapped up on the 4th of July with nationwide supply chain issues and staffing shortages. This year, we didn't see as many people in years past. According to a fair spokesperson, the fair saw an average of 46,000 people a day, and I was one of them. That's down 19%, though, actually, from 2019. Saturday, total attendance hit over 848,000. But in 2019, total attendance reached more than 1.5 million over those 20 27 days. And while attendance is down, fair spending has reached new levels. In 2019, there was only one day when spending topped a million dollars. This year, at least four days reached that milestone. Well, even though the 4th of July is now well behind us, I want to make sure that you saw that drone show in IB. Imperial Beach tried something different this year. The usual fireworks show was replaced by a high tech drone show with colored lights impressing a lot of people. Here again is Regina Urita. It's 4th of July and for some people that means heading to the beach to celebrate and eventually ending your night watching a nearby fireworks show. But this year, the city of Imperial Beach replaced smoke and debris and instead welcomed a new display of lights. 180 colorful and festive synchronized drones flew over the beach pier at night to put on a different type of light show. A new entertainment that beachgoers didn't know how to react to at first. Oh, I looked it up because everybody was saying, oh, it's not going to be the same at the beach, you know. But I looked it up. I thought it was pretty cool and everybody's like saying different things and I said, hey, why not give it a shot? The unexpected change came after the company in charge of putting together a fireworks show canceled on the city. To salvage the night, city manager Andy Hall says that's when the city came up with a drone show. They're able to customize the show, so they're able to put in some images that are specific to Imperial Beach. Uh, they can synchronize some of the images to the music, so it's pretty cool. While some are used to a traditional fireworks show, the futuristic display that had lights changing in different shapes with thousands of colorful combinations intrigued many who had never seen a high-tech drone show. We're used to the fireworks show, but we're willing to give it a try to see how it comes out, so I'm excited. Some even saying they didn't mind the change and were at the beach just looking forward to enjoy some music by the water and spend time with the family. I've never seen a drone show show yet. We're looking forward to it. It's one of the first time a drone show has taken flight over San Diego. Verge Aero, the drone company, says it helps to reduce wildfire risks, pollution, and loud noises. I'm really excited and we're really excited. You know, we're always trying to push the boundaries of where we can fly the drones. You know, flying out over a pier is just a really awesome experience and we're really excited to bring it to San Diego and just to bring it to another place that we've never flown before. Adding that this type of new entertainment is becoming popular and has been replaced by fireworks shows dozens of times. Pretty cool, Regina, thanks. Hey, well, also this week, Carlsbad's new Village Arts Center started the first stage of its $2.5 million makeover. On top of renovations, the center is also getting a new name in honor of Dia Hurston, a local legacy in the arts. This will be the first arts center in the country named after a black woman in the past 50 years. I am so pleased to be recognized for all the volunteer work that I've done in this community over the last 35 years. How does it feel? It feels great. Congrats. Construction on the Dia Hurston New Village Arts Center will finish this fall. As always, thanks so much for staying informed and caring about what's happening in our great community. Hope you join me once again as I take you around San Diego. Have a great rest of your day. I'm Jenny Day for CBS 8.